Good evening. I'm Maria Otero, Director of uh, Corporate Sponsorship at the America Society and the Council of the Americas. It is my pleasure to welcome everyone here tonight, as well as those watching through the webcast. Uh, thank you for joining us. A special thank you to the New York International Arbitration Center, our partner for this panel discussion. Another special thank you to our two sponsors for tonight's program, Clearly Gottlieb and Norton Rose Fulbright. And also we thank you Telefonica for sponsoring our webcast. We have assembled a great panel of speakers this evening. Our conversation will be moderated by Aníbal Sabater, partner at Norton Rose Fulbright. And our four panelists will be Gabriela Álvarez Ávila, partner at Cortes Mallet, Natalia Lamas, associate partner at uh, associate lawyer at Ferro Castro Neves, Jeffrey Rosenthal, partner at Cleary Gottlieb, and Henry Weisberg, partner at Sherman Sterling. After moderating the discussion for the panelists, Aníbal will open the floor for questions from the audience. I hope that you all engage in this wonderful conversation tonight. Again, thank you to all the speakers for participating tonight. And Aníbal, I turn it to you. Thank you very much, Maria. Thank you very much to the Council of the Americas, the New York International Arbitration Center. And thank you to each of you for coming today, braving the snow or whatever remains of it. The weather was fortunately a little bit kinder than earlier this week. As you fully realize, we have four stellar panelists today, and we're essentially going to be talking about the pros and cons of choosing New York as the seat of your Latin American related cases. Before we get into the debate, as a debate I hope there will be, uh, let me just try to put the question in context. Uh, New York as the seat of Latin American arbitration cases. Does it even make sense? I mean, does it, does it even merit to consider the question? Does it even merit to think of New York as the place of disputes that may not have any relationship at all with the US in general or with the, uh, or, or with the, the city, with the state in particular? Well, as TV anchors would say, let's look at the, at the hard facts. And the, um, my law firm, now Norton Rose Fulbright, until recently Fulbright and Jaworski, conducts yearly a survey uh, whereby we ask uh, corporate counsel, mostly in the US and in the UK, some specific questions, uh, generally to get their feel as to where they think litigation is headed what they think the biggest trends are in litigation worldwide. As you may see there, back in 05, we asked them what they thought the big international arbitration seats, what the big international arbitration places were, generally. And they were given a long list of cities worldwide from which they could choose their favorite place to arbitrate. Um, now, you should be looking at the green bar, which reflects the total responses to the question. And if you look at that, at that bar, you'll see that New York scored fairly well, right after London. London seemed to be, back then, among the respondents, the favorite city, with 31% uh, of the respondents choosing it. But then New York came up as a close second with 25% of the respondents choosing it. Now, if you, if you see the breakdown, and, and you'll realize that the respondents were mostly from the US and the UK, you'll see that pretty the bridge, which is the blue bar, overwhelmingly chose London and, and fairly underwhelmingly <laughs> failed to choose New York, with only 3% of them liking them, uh, whereas New York was uh, overwhelmingly chosen by, by people in the US and not so um, happily chosen by people at, outside the US. But nonetheless, when you look at the combined number, when you look at the green bar, New York was a very solid, a very healthy second uh, place. Now, we keep changing from year to year the questions that we ask to our respondents. We don't always ask them the same question two years in a row. Uh, last year, 2012, uh, survey released in 2013, we asked them a slightly different question. We asked um, the corporate counsel in the US and in the UK if they had an arbitration in the US, what would be their seat of choice. What city would they go to? Interestingly, most of the US-based respondents, 27%, 
chose to go with New York. But there was some competition. US respondents were a little bit divided. Now, if you look at the UK respondents, they overwhelmingly, 43%, decided to go with New York. So uh, there may be a little bit of a difference. There may be a little bit of a wrinkle, a nuance, depending on the country, uh, depending on the country of origin of the person asking, uh, sorry, of the person responding to the question. But generally, there's a very solid trend uh, showing that New York is the favorite place to arbitrate when you have a dispute in the US. And one of the favorite places to arbitrate generally worldwide, irrespective of the location of the dispute. Now, are these Fulbright and Jaworski, Norton Rose Fulbright numbers backed up by reality? What are the, what are the institutions saying? Well, you can see here some numbers uh, from the ICC, and um, I have also some numbers from the ICDR. I think I got them maybe too late, not in time to, to, to show them today. The numbers are consistent when you check the ICC numbers and the ICDR numbers. The bottom line being that New York is by far the favorite place to arbitrate, at the very least, when you have a dispute seated in the Americas. That's what the ICC numbers show. 22% uh, of the cases that the ICC administers that have an American seat anywhere in the Americas, North, Central, South America, end up being seated in uh, New York. Now, the ICDR numbers are even more overwhelming. When you look at the ICDR numbers, and I'm sorry that they're not available there, I'm happy to send the numbers by email to any of you who, who desires to get them. The ICDR numbers show that about 22 to 24% of the cases that the ICDR handles are actually seated in New York. So there's, there's, there's a very solid trend showing that New York is a very liked seat for international arbitration cases. Now, how is that? What are the reasons for that? Is, it, is that surprising? Well, not entirely. New York, among other things, has a very favorable uh, uh, a very favorable legal framework applying to international arbitration cases, a very well-developed case law, a very well-formed judiciary, uh, readily able to deal with international arbitration questions. You have the breakdown of the details here. There were, in the last couple of years, there were five 1782 requests uh, related to Latin America that reached New York-based and, and for those of you who are not familiar with, with it, uh, 1782 is a provision in, in US Code Chapter 28 that in essence allows a federal court in the US to grant discovery in aid of proceedings being conducted in a foreign court or before an international tribunal. Five cases, that's no small amount. Um, sorry, five cases were, uh, five of the 1782 applications that reached New York courts in the last two years uh, involved arbitration, three uh, involved Latin American matters, matters in which either the parties or the place of performance were based in Latin America. All those 1782 questions, uh, sorry, all those 1782 requests were granted. How about challenges to awards rendered in New York? When an award is rendered in New York, when New York is the seat of an arbitration, the parties can, as you know, under the Federal Arbitration Act, resort to a New York court to challenge the award. Well, as you may find here, in the last couple of years, there were 11 challenges to international arbitration related awards uh, filed before New York courts. Five uh, of those awards were eventually confirmed. Four cases were settled before the court had an opportunity to rule on the case. Two cases were vacated. They were two cases in which upon reading the ruling you'll realize uh, it was almost an obvious candidate for an ailment. Um, you have some highlighted cases there if you, if you are curious about the specific uh, or the most significant cases that got confirmed. Same goes, same applies to the enforcement of foreign awards. What happens when, when an award has been issued, has been rendered overseas and a party takes it to New York to enforce it. Well, still, the judiciary is very supportive. Uh, if you check here, there were seven petitions to enforce in the last couple of years. 
uh, Latin American awards in New York. Four of those petitions were fully granted, three are still pending. So there's no denial, there's no failure to enforce in New York foreign awards uh, yet. W what do these numbers, what do these statistics uh, come to show? And I'll, and I'll leave it at that. They come to show that there's a good case for discussing New York as a seat for Latin American cases. There's a supportive uh, judiciary. New York is a well-known city around the world. It's a well-known arbitration hub around the world. It's in fact the favorite, if not, or maybe one of the two uh, most favored arbitration places around the world. What does it have to offer? What are the upsides and downsides of choosing it, not only for an international arbitration case in general, but for a Latin American dispute in particular? And I'm going to, I'm going to start the debate, turning now to, to you, Natalia, probably with a very basic question, uh, which is, does this debate even make sense at all? We, we're talking about choosing arbitration in New York for Latin American disputes at a time in which most countries, or at least uh, most developed economies, have already ratified the New York Convention. They are parties to it. Uh, most uh, jurisdictions around the world have, in one form or another, adopted the ancestral model law on arbitration. Does it still matter where you, where you sit your arbitration? Yes. And, and, and the classic question, when you are uh, negotiating your arbitration clause and, and, and you need to give up something. Uh, is the seat so important? Would you, would you stick to it? Would you, would you give up your, your seat choice? Uh, for, for instance, uh, bargaining or trying to bargain for a better substantive law choice? Is this still relevant at all nowadays? Thank you, Anibal. Actually, it's still relevant, at least in my opinion, I guess. Uh, there is a leading Swiss expert which is frequently <coughs> quoted as having said exactly what you, you've mentioned. With the increasing uniformity of arbitration laws and the ratification of uh, the New York Convention, is there a need to, to go to, a, uh, uh, is, is there a need to go to a, an arbitration friendly cent, uh, city for, for a seat? And that's, that's her question actually. Uh, and uh, lots of commentators have, have said that it's still, there's still a need because we cannot only look at the law, we have to look at the, all the legal framework and how the courts uh, <coughs> respond to, to this uh, law and how they apply that. And it's quite different uh, at some point, even if it's the UNCITRA law or the, the, the New York Convention. So I, I think that we have to recognize the increasing uniformity, but it's still something important, at least regarding the legal framework for your arbitration to have, uh, uh, to really choose your, your, your seat. On the other hand, when you think about uh, substantive uh, law applicable to the merits, as you, you've mentioned, uh, well, you're, you're trading off uh, something at high stake because the substantial uh, law applicable to, applicable, to, applicable to the merits is going to be the <coughs> law who is going to uh, uh, deal with remedies and the, uh, the kind of damages you can have. And so it's really important that when you are negotiating, you take into account the law and you know the law. It's not, it's not uh, a very good choice to... to uh, choose a, a, a law to your contract without knowing it, and it, sometimes it happens. <laughs> Just like, oh, I want Swiss law because it's neutral. Well, actually, uh, do you know Swiss law? Do you have a good expert in Swiss law? And, and do you think it's going to be positive for your contract in Swiss law, in your position in the contractual relationship? So uh, my, my answer would be depends on the case. If I had to trade, to trade off, it would depend on the case, actually, because for example, I'm Brazilian. If I had, if I were uh, a, the Brazilian lawyer for a Brazilian client, I would be well. Sorry, I would be happy to uh, trade off uh, Brazilian law for New York seat of arbitration. You know, if my American counterpart said, "Oh, I want the, uh, the arbitration to be seated in New York," and I said, "Can I, can I have the law applicable to the merits, of the Brazilian law?" I would be happy to do so. You're <laughs> not saying that because you're in New York. <laughs> <laughs> no, because New York is a very good city to come, but and to visit. But uh, that that would be something that I would be happy to. But 
in, in other examples, probably I wouldn't do the same thing. Uh, and, and clearly there's some uniformity when it comes to the laws. There's no doubt about that. But, but clearly there's no such uniformity when it comes to the judiciary, to the courts, yes. to, 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 to their sophistication and how familiar they are with complex international arbitration yeah. questions. I mean, I, I, find, <coughs> I find, Annabelle, that yeah. uh, you know, quite often <coughs> uh, you know, I'm asked by my corporate colleagues as they're drafting, you know, clauses for arbitration in merger agreements or other big complex transactions uh, you know, for guidance on both drafting the clause and also you know, where should we put the, the situs, you know, perhaps choice of law, although that's usually more decided by the, the transactional lawyers themselves. But when we talk to the clients, a lot of times you know, the first thing that they want to talk about is you know, where is most convenient to them. And the fact is, is that's, that really should be low on the list because you know, in, in this day and age, we could all hop on a plane, spend a week at a hotel, you know, whether it's in Mexico City or Rio or, or in New York City. And, and the, the thing that the clients often, and frankly, a lot of our corporate colleagues uh, are not really focused on are how developed is the law and how familiar is the judiciary in some of the ancillary relief that you might need. Because you know, the three things that leap to mind predominantly, and people think, well, will my award get enforced here? And that's you know, kind of first and foremost what people think of. But in fact, other things that you really need to think of perhaps even more, because with the New York Convention, you know, theoretically, you really shouldn't have difficulty enforcing an award uh, in any of the places. And frankly, if, if a party is located in a certain place, that may drive where you decide to enforce it. But does the jurisdiction have well-developed law in terms of uh, provisional relief in aid of arbitration? You know, might you need an injunction? Might you possibly even need attachments? Um, what about motions to compel arbitration? You know, what's the development of the law and how familiar is the judiciary and how likely are they to, to force the parties to compel arbitration? And something that's also very important and sometimes overlooked is, uh, is the courts in that jurisdiction prepared to give anti-suit injunctions? Because you know, especially in international arbitration, you may have one party goes to arbitrate, the other party files a lawsuit in their home court and says, you know, judge, you know, ignore the arbitration clause, I'm, a, you know, I'm based here in Bolivia, and we need to be able to litigate this suit here in Bolivia. Do you have a jurisdiction where the court, whether it's in New York or another US city or Brazil or Argentina or any place else, that understands what their authority is, that has the authority uh, to enjoin a party from bringing collateral litigation elsewhere. And I think that's something that often is not thought of, but to me, the development of the law in those particular areas is, is critical towards where you pick for your seat of arbitration. And, and Jeff, you're highlighting some areas where New York has fairly developed, fairly favorable, fairly pro-arbitration laws. Uh, Henry, let me, let me turn to you now. Uh, when you talk to people overseas, they, they mostly agree with, with many of the advantages that Jeff is uh, setting out that would make New York uh, a nice seat for, for hosting disputes. But generally, they also see some, some difficulties, not only with New York in particular, but with the US in general as a seat for arbitration cases, whether or not related to Latin America. You talk to people overseas, you talk to lawyers, you talk to clients, they, 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 they are fond of mentioning the manifest disregard of the law theory that, in their view, may facilitate the annulment of awards. They, they express concerns about the broadness of discovery. They are aware that PACER exists, and if any of the uh, dispute or any of its aspects end up in federal court or maybe even in state court litigation, uh, it's going to become public. Those are some of the perceived dis uh, disadvantages of choosing a U.S. seat for your arbitration. Are, are these real disadvantages? <coughs> um, I don't think they are, but first of all, I mean, that <coughs> list is, is, we all go to a lot of conferences and we have clients all over and yeah, there is this common sort of indictment of New York by non-New York lawyers, often Brazilian, um, <laughs> um, who say, oh, you, you're nuts to go to New York. You should never go to New York. And usually first on the list is this manifest disregard theory. And for those of you who don't, don't know, New, US arbitration law 
is statu largely statutory, the Federal Arbitration Act, which has a list, a very small list of reasons why an award should not be enforced. And um, there's this additional judicial doctrine called manifest disregard of the law, which has a very checkered history and is, we're all very uncertain on what it means and what it, where it comes from, but it seems to exist. But um, the reality is it's almost never a problem. And there's actually a fascinating document put out by a committee that Jeff and I are on, um, written by a guy named Larry Shore, which analyzes every case that's gone to the Second Circuit um, in the history of man. Um, in which manifest disregard of the law has been, has been raised, and there's not one in which an international award was set aside on the basis of this theory. And so it's something that exists, and it's something that you have to deal with. One of the cases that you cited um, on your list of cases, um, you call the Gianetti versus Abagoa, which is my case. Um, perfect example, it was raised by the other side. It was in the argument we had in the Second Circuit in December, it was not even mentioned. You know, they had another ground. The award was enforced, which is what we wanted. But this theory, the, court, the judges didn't even ask a question about it. It just doesn't really, in real life, figure. So I think that when you hear those words, you know, really, it's, it's not an issue. Um, the other thing that you hear, because there seems to be this fear, which is often justified in litigation, in the world that US, the US has this runaway discovery system, I'd say a couple things about that. First of all, you've never seen anything like a good deposition. <laughs> I mean, if you have a good deposition, you're, you can end the other guy's case. So uh, US discovery gets a bad rap because it actually is very useful. Um, but in reality, as what people I think are most afraid of are, are really two things. One are depositions. Um, and I have never seen a deposition in the international arbitration other than by agreement of the parties. Um, I mean, I had a case recently where we literally had a guy who had a, a medical problem and was not allowed to leave his town in Germany, so we had, took his deposition, but that was by agreement. Other than that, I've never seen a deposition other than by agreement in, a, in an international arbitration, Latin American or otherwise. The other thing which is an issue, uh, probably the predominant issue in litigation today, is electronic discovery. And um, it remains the case that um, the kind of electronic discovery that you see in federal court domestic litigation in the United States is still extremely rare in, um, in international arbitration. And there are two ways to deal with it. One is you can deal with it in your clause. So if you have the presence of mind to draft your clause appropriately, you can eliminate that risk. And second, you can deal with it in, how you, in who you select for your tribunal. Uh, but the basic reality is the kind of the scope of discovery that we see in international um, arbitration in New York and in the U.S. generally s remains dramatically truncated from that w of what you see in litigation in, in, in judicial proceedings. So again, I think it's a bugaboo. It's a false issue. Um, the final point, and then no, no, I, yeah, go ahead. Um, the the other thing that you hear, which really relates to enforcement is that, gee, I don't want to go to the US because if I enforce or challenge, have to challenge there, my award has to be filed in court. It did become public. Yeah, and it becomes public. And you know, I recently had a case where we won a case in London, and the other side filed the award, and it was not public. And so isn't that a better place? Um, and that is a reality. We famously, and it's an important social value, I think, have a very open court system. Um, but to the ex it, it really depends what you're trying to protect. It's not that hard to get, for example, intellectual property re references in an award sealed. So you can, you may not be able to get your entire award sealed, but if you have the Coke formula in your arbitration award, or you know the molecule that you're fighting about described, you can the get the iPhone that. technology now. Sorry, the iPhone technology. The iPhone technology, <laughs> yes. Well, no, the Coke formula I think <laughs> is still the paradigm that everybody always uses. Um, you know, you can get that protected, um, and it is fairly rare. In the old days, I used to see people filing the whole record, you know, including the transcripts of the proceedings, etc., 
and you don't see that much anymore. So there is a difference that you're more likely to have your law award exposed. But if you're the winner, you want that. You know, it just depends on your point of view. If you're the loser, you don't want that. If you, I, since I win all my cases, I always want them out there. <laughs> Excellent. Jeff, I, think I, I was just going to expound on a couple of uh, points and, and agree very much with what Henry said. And, you know, one thing with regard to the, the manifest disregard, I think, in fact, it's even broader insofar as th this report that Larry Shore uh, spearheaded for the City Bar Committee, uh, along with an article that a, a former uh, partner of mine, Dick Holbert, had, uh, had written a couple of years ago called The Case for a Coherent Application of Chapter 2 of the FAA. The two of them together found that not a single circuit court anywhere in the United States has ever, uh, has ever vacated an arbitration award under the manifest disregard theory. Because um, actually it's interesting, if you look at the cases where manifest disregard has applied, there are more, almost all, all domestic labor cases mm -hmm. where in labor arbitration some arbitrator has ignored some mm -hmm. provision of the National Labor mm -hmm. Relations Act or something. It's just not a factor in mm -hmm. international cases. And, and, and it's also not really an issue that's unique to the United States insofar as if you look through the arbitration statutes of other jurisdictions including the UK, you know, it's not called manifest disregard, uh, but they have similar standards, you know, misapply or misapprehend, uh, you know, the applicable law. So it's, it's, it's really a theoretical possibility kind of anywhere uh, and in actuality not really applied, you know, particularly here. And the only, uh, only other thing I wanted to add with regards to, you know, the discovery issue, you know, in fact, I don't really view that as a situs issue so much as a who the arbitrators are issue, which is often guided by the choice of law. Because you know, I've had arbitrations here in New York where the panel are you know, three Mexican lawyers uh, because it involves a, a Mexican dispute. And you know, it, it's their experiences that are going to guide how much and whether discovery is done, as opposed to the fact that they happen to be sitting in New York versus sitting in Mexico City. And in fact, um, you know, th there are trends in international arbitration, I think more trends towards uh, a little bit more open document Dis, uh, disclosure, uh, not, uh, I agree with Henry, I have not seen a case that's had depositions when the parties have not uh, agreed upon it and, and sought it. Uh, but again, to the extent that a party seeks something, whether it's documents or depositions or even possibly third party discovery, I really think that the, the choice of the arbitrators and the choice of the law uh, which guides the choice of the arbitrators is gonna is gonna really guide that much more than the scientists. Je Jeff, and a few minutes ago you were talking about the call that you sometimes get from your corporate colleagues, and and, and, and let's think of this example for a minute. It's 11 p.m. on a Friday. You're 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 about to go to bed or to go to sleep. You get the call. They they are closing a deal, and they need very prompt advice. It's it's probably the only remaining uh, open item uh, where they need to reach agreement with the other side. Um, the arbitration seat, this agreement to arbitrate. Uh, your firm's client wants to arbitrate in the US, the other side does not. And, and your colleagues want to very promptly, in a nutshell, know the pros and cons of arbitrating in the US or outside. And, and we've been talking about some of these ghosts that are not real threats to arbitrating in the US, but, but th there are some other real dangers. I mean, w w what would you say are the pros and cons? that should guide your decision? I mean, I, I, I think a lot of them are what I touched upon with respect to the, the first question and also some of the things that, that Henry had just said, which is if a court outside of New York, and, and frankly, not all the US jurisdictions are, are equal as well. I mean, you could, you could do searches and see that, you know, in New York, for example, there's over a thousand cases that cite the FAA uh, at the district court level. Whereas if you look at Florida or Texas, it's about 200. If you look at California, it's 350. If you look at the circuit court cases as well, uh, there are more in the second circuit than any other circuit court in the United States. So you know, there are jurisdictions that you could pick in the United States where you might not get a judiciary as familiar uh, with some of these doctrines that we've mentioned. But when clients are considering other jurisdictions, the one thing I, I do tell them, as I, as I said in the first question, is uh, don't let your desire to, to be home or you know, to be in a particular city because you like that city or it's, it's got convenient flights, don't let that guide the decision. Uh, but really think more about 
what is the law in those jurisdictions and how developed is it? And, and some, some are more favorable than others. You know, and, and sometimes we are convincing clients, well, do you really want to go to this particular country where, and, and we'll do it always in consultation with local lawyers, because uh, I, I certainly don't, uh, don't say that I know the laws of you know, Peru and how the, the laws are developed there with respect to arbitration or, or a whole host of other countries, but we will talk to the local lawyers and we will ask them, you know, what kind of case law do you have if I need to compel arbitration? Mm -hmm. uh, or if, uh, if I'm gonna need an injunction because somebody's gonna be dissipating assets or something like that. Uh, and we're gonna let that guide us, but I think that um, if, if I'm not comfortable with the fact that we're gonna get these main areas of relief to protect the arbitration itself that we can get in New York, uh, I'll urge the client to you know, put aside their views about personal preferences. Now we've been talking a lot about choosing the US in general as the seat for uh, disputes. There's a particular area where this is a very sensitive choice and that's investment arbitration of which you do a lot, Gabriela. Yeah. Um, especially NAFTA cases and BIT cases. Uh, these are cases in which usually there's a respondent state it's, it's still very unusual to see a claimant state, but we're seeing some cases. We recently saw Peru bring a claim against a Spanish company. But for those cases in which you have a Latin American state defending an international law claim brought by an investor, choosing the US is not always everyone's cup of tea. I remember having some very mixed experiences, dealing, uh, having sued once a government, um, under a treaty that didn't provide for a seat, and we called the government and we said, where would you agree to arbitrate? And they said, anywhere but the US. And then we've had the, the exact opposite, suing a different government under a different treaty, and that government being amenable to arbitrating in the US. It's, it's probably not always, or not only, a legal debate. W what's your experience in choosing the US for Latin American investment disputes? Yeah. Well, let me tell you first that um, in investor state cases, many times it doesn't matter when these cases are under the exit convention because the place of arbitration is not a question that would uh, play a role. It's going to be the I within the exit system everything that happens during the arbitration. However, there are a number of arbitrations that are not under the exit convention and um, I thought about like one example that we give us the opportunity to discuss this. Um, NAFTA uh, has very specific rules to choose the place of arbitration. And in NAFTA you have three countries, Mexico, Canada, and the US, and you have two that are not members of the exit convention. So as a matter of rule, all the NAFTA cases are not under the exit convention and therefore the place of arbitration matters. And um, then uh, if you look at NAFTA, the rule is if there is no agreement between the parties, which so far there has been never an agreement to go outside what the uh, 11, Article 1130 provides, uh, then you have to follow what this provision uh, states. And NAFTA Article 1130 says it needs to be in one of the NAFTA countries as long as one of the NAFTA countries is a signatory of the, of the New York Convention. And the three are signatories of the New York Convention, so it needs to be either in Mexico or in the US or Canada. And just let me tell you, never so far in Mexico. So <laughs> what, is, what is at stake here is either Canada or the US. So you would think that since um, we got rid of London, New York would basically be very important, <laughs> right? And, um, but let me just go by telling a little bit more about the rules. And um, so when you, the other two options is either you have an exit addition, additional facility case and the only rule uh, to follow is that it needs to be an uh, a state that is a signatory of the New York Convention, so it doesn't have any, anything more. And in practice, when um, we have seen uncitral cases, NAFTA tribunals have also looked at paragraph 22 of the uncitral notes on organizing arbitral proceedings, which means that other factors could play a role. 
suitability of the law and arbitral procedure, which we have discussed that here, convenience of the parties and the arbitrators that we have heard maybe not top rank, <laughs> but has been discussed in other cases, availability and cost of support services needed, and location of the subject matter in dispute and proximity of evidence, which has played an important role. So what has been the criteria followed by NAFTA tribunals uh, in practice? First, neutrality of place of arbitration. <coughs> and this has really played a role in many cases. Um, I will give you an example. An example. For instance, in the UPA's case, the tribunal held that Canada's measures were at stake and therefore Canada was not really an option. And um, so it needed to be in uh, the US. Uh, claimant requested DC, Boston, or San Francisco, which I found interesting. <laughs> Anything <laughs> and that, about New York? Uh, no, no. And uh, <laughs> the tribunal decided that uh, it would go for DC. And the reason was that DC could have be, been seen as having the neutrality of being the seat of the World Bank and ICSID, rather than, and nobody wants to pay attention to this, although everybody mentions it, is that uh, is the seat also of the US federal government, right? <laughs> and if the US is being sued, it could play a role, but no, so far not. And uh, finally decided, the tribunal decided on um, DC. Then a second uh, criterion was the suitability of law on arbitral procedures of the place of arbitration, clear, predictable, and limited procedures for challenging awards, effective mechanism for recognition and enforcement of awards. These three uh, elements that usually played a very important role. When you see competing analysis between choosing some place in Canada or the US, tribu NAFTA tribunals have seen have said, well, we cannot really say that one judiciary or the other would be better than other. And politically speaking, <laughs> would be also very sensitive, rather, <laughs> right? So <coughs> then um, other, but, so f but what has been really playing a role is the, l the neutrality, as I said first, and also the location of the subject marine in dispute, and the location, and more importantly, uh, the proximity to key evidence. And this was crucial, crucial and a crucial element in the Mobile versus Canada case in which the tribunal chose Toronto as a place of arbitration because of proximity of evidence. And then the last criterion was location of the parties, <coughs> representatives, and members of the tribunal. So, so far, those are the ground rules under NAFTA. Ha have you seen in NAFTA any state, uh, any state sorry, take an adamant position that they will not arbitrate in, in one state or in another contracting state, as a matter of principle? Well, what I, I have seen is that there is always an agreement not to uh, have Mexico as the seat of arbitration. <laughs> yeah. But then it's really very competitive, because when it's Canada, the state that is being sued is uh, um, claimants ask for the US, and Canada, of course, for a seat in Canada. What is interesting is that Mexico has uh, always mostly asked for Canada as a place of arbitration, although in certain cases have a, they have agreed on DC. Yes. Yeah. That's very interesting. Excellent. Well, we, we've been talking a lot about the US in general as a potential seat for Latin American related disputes. Let's focus now on New York specifically within, within the US. Uh, Jeff, back to you. When you compare New York uh, judiciary, applicable laws, facilities with other places in the US to arbitrate, especially to arbitrate Latin American disputes, what does it have to offer? What, if any, is lacking in New York that you could find somewhere else? Oh, I, I think that, you know, as I had mentioned before, you know, one of the things to look at when you're picking a situs among, you know, whether it's DC, New York, Los Angeles, Miami, I know is another popular uh, place for Latin American arbitrations. Um, you know, in, in fact, the development of the law can be very different. And in some cases, the interpretation of the law and the power of the courts is different in the different jurisdictions. I had mentioned before the statistics at the district court level, there's over a thousand cases in New York that cite the FAA 
Uh, the next leading one is California at 350. Uh, so district courts are much more familiar in New York. Circuit courts uh, here in the Second Circuit is more familiar. But substantively, the courts also interpret their powers differently. So for example, the Second Circuit is of the view that uh, it can entertain applications for preliminary injunctions in aid of arbitration, and that's consistent with the New York Convention. And the Fifth Circuit, which covers <coughs> Texas, for example, they share that view. The Third Circuit doesn't share that view. So if people were considering, for example, Philadelphia for an arbitration, which is in the Third Circuit, they don't believe that the New York Convention uh, gives district courts the jurisdiction to award provisional remedies when the parties agree to arbitrate. Uh, similarly, there's a question over, well, what happens when the tribunal is actually constituted? Does the court's role go away completely there? And the Second Circuit, again, it takes a broader view uh, that says that if, if a judicial relief is needed uh, in aid of arbitration in some way, even though the tribunal has already been constituted, uh, the Second Circuit does permit that under appropriate circumstances. Ninth Circuit, for example, which covers California, uh, does not permit uh, a district court to, uh, to grant provisional remedies when an arbitral tribunal is, is already constituted. So it is important to think about, you know, and, and not everybody's going to come out on the same side of that in terms of what you want. If you're, if you're a party from whom uh, you think provisional relief might be sought, because you have to think when you're drafting your arbitration clause, is my client likely going to be a, a claimant or a respondent if there's a dispute? And often, you know, for example, in M&A transactions, you can think about how the disputes might play out. Mm -hmm. uh, so maybe you do want a jurisdiction uh, that is, is less friendly to provisional remedies than others. Um, but certainly, uh, the law is not uniform nationwide, and you do need to familiarize yourself uh, with the law in the different circuits. Um, one other thing in New York, it's not really an issue with respect to international arbitrations, uh, but the trend, for example, in our commercial division here is uh, there's been a commercial division judge that has been kind of named as our arbitration expert such that uh, cases that involve arbitration issues typically in the first instance might get funneled uh, to this particular judge who then can develop an expertise. Uh, and you're not educating a judge anew. Uh, there's been talk among arbitration practitioners here of, you know, is it feasible to extend that to the federal courts in the way that some other disputes, you know, IP disputes and stuff, there are some judges within the Southern District that have been developing expertise and get first crack at some of those cases. Might we have some judges who uh, can develop similar expertise, um, you know, in, in international arbitration and the issues that they confront? So certainly, you do want to, to get a sense when you're picking your situs, even if it's within the US, of what is the law, how developed it is, is it, how likely are we to get a judge uh, that, that knows it right off the bat as opposed to has to be educated as to these precedents. Can, Thank you. Henry, go ahead. Yeah, I'll, I'll, um, and I, I agree with what Jeff has said. Um, and I just want to reemphasize that often clients, um, certainly less sophisticated clients, think very m much geographically and you know where is it convenient where are the hotels gee are there hearing rooms you know where do i have my offices where are the documents where are the witnesses and all of that is like beyond tertiary i don't know what fourth place <laughs> is um, because um, the, what you have to recognize about situs is it's a totally illegal fiction i had a case new york situs we never did anything in New York. It was against um, a Korean, it was against the Korean government because of, because of flights, and there were a lot of witnesses coming from Seoul. All the hearings we had, which were extensive, were in Vancouver. So we, we liked Vancouver, it was convenient for everybody, so we did everything in Vancouver. It was cheaper than New York. So we did it all in Vancouver, but this legal, the situs rem always remained in New York, and the governing law of the, the platform for the arbitration was New York law. You have to, that's the point of view you need to have. And so getting back to Jeff's point, yeah, you should be completely focused on what's the law, which is both statutory law and how it's applied. I think the main thing that New York has, which I do think is unique in the world, because our, our law may not be the best, but when you put the law together with the judiciary, and the judiciary means since everything goes to federal court, 
Judge Ramos in the state court, he's the arbitration judge, but he has no cases. Um, you know, international cases by definition are going to go to the federal court. The Southern District of New York has, what, 25 to 30 sitting judges. They're among the best in the country. And one that thing that's very important, they're all overworked. And not every federal judge in other districts are overworked. So they're not looking for work. So if they can get rid of a case on the basis, oh, there's an arbitration clause. I'm going to send this to arbitration. Yeah, oh, I don't want to, you know, I'm not going to monkey with the decision of the arbitrators because, you know, there's an arbitration clause. You know, I want to move on to all those securities cases and all those drug cases I have. And so I think this, to me, the single strongest thing that New York has is those two dozen judges, you know, who we know by name, and they're all, to the last man and a woman, they're very pro-arbitration. Also, as, as Jeff said, and I, and I want to emphasize this, I keep harking back to this case that I recently had, the law, the construction of the FAA is dramatically different around the country. And the, one, the thing we were fighting about in my case, that Abengoa case, was the definition in the FAA of the phrase evident partiality. And a case can be set aside in, under the FAA if an arbitrator showed evident partiality. And the Second Circuit has an extremely pro-arbitration definition of evident partiality. I mean, it has to be, it has to be, you know, virtual that the arbitrator virtually had a closed mind. You know, he was absolutely he or she was absolutely partial to one side. There are many other circuits which apply a standard which is well, if there was any appearance that the arbitrator was, you know, partial. You know, which, and you see cases where they, well, he's asked this guy more questions than he asked that guy. So he must have been partial. So you never have that kind of thing here. So, you know, I think the number one, two, and three item is really the quality of the judiciary and their pro arbitration outlook. And you can look around the country, particularly some of the southern states, you know, they still hate arbitration. And um, you just don't want to be there if you're trying to arbitrate. I'll add one more thing, by the way, where people you know, talk about where I want to be or where are the documents. You know, people often say, well, New York's an expensive city. You know, and, and New York, it's not a cheap city, obviously. And you know, when you compare it perhaps to some place like Miami or something like that. But you, know, you need to tell your clients in the context of, of a billion dollar transaction. You know, obviously, if you have a $50,000 dispute, you know, questions, you know, are you going to be arbitrating this anyway, realistically? But, you know, they need to think about the amount that's likely to be in dispute and how much is the incremental cost of a particular city going to be relative to the amount in, in dispute, the amount you're going to spend on all your legal fees and, you know, lost business opportunities of arbitrating and things like that. And when you put it in that perspective, it really should not drive us. Thank you very much, Henry, Jeff. Uh, Natalia, you, you, you practice in Brazil. When you're representing Brazilian clients, does this issue come up frequently, namely there's agreement to use the U.S. as the place of arbitration and you're discussing specifically what city, what state within the U.S.? And, and, and if so, what's your experience telling you? Is, is there a bias for one city? Is there a preference? Actually, Miami has been <coughs> playing a, an increasing role in this and exactly because of, of being cheaper than, than New York which is, well, which is a shame because we, we I have the impression, at least for, as a foreigner, I have the impression that the second secret, secret is, is more developed than, than the, the one that covers uh, Florida. But, well, uh, they often come with that, no, New York is too expensive, I don't want New York, and <laughs> which is something that you have to, to deal with. And, but comparing in the, the United States, I guess, for Latin American parties, today it's Miami, the, the most competitive city uh, against New York, I guess. And, and historically, Miami has the port of entry of much Latin American investment into the U.S. I mean, it, it's, it, it was always amazing to go to the airport there and see all these Latin American, yes. Spanish-speaking like banks yes, saying, we have offices here, and, and maybe didn't even have offices in, yes. in, in, in New York. So, so is that where you see the competition coming? against New York? Yes, I, I, that, that's where, where I see the competition coming. I, I'm, I'm not afraid of, well, Houston maybe in oil, some oil and gas uh, cases, but I'm not afraid of other cities. DC is mostly for investment cases, which we don't actually deal with. So uh, I think Miami is the most uh, important city, uh, at least if you, if you regard 
regarding competition with New York. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. I, I'd have to say, by the way, as somebody who has <coughs> arbitrated cases in, is in a variety of large and small cities, one thing that people don't think of that you know when you're actually on the ground, that I'm sure Henry, you've also experienced the same thing is, you know, in some of these places that clients are thinking about having, you know, when it's after six o'clock at night, <laughs> and you're working out of the hotel, are you going to be able to get your copies of your exhibits and things like that? And and you know, being in Lausanne, Switzerland, and trying to figure out how you're going to actually prepare for tomorrow, uh, you know, these can be real logistical challenges that people don't think of and. I think you do need to think a little bit about, you know, the hearing isn't just simply where am I going to stay at the hotel and, and all that. I, I agree with you mostly. I, I think there's some value in arbitrating in boring cities where witnesses that you need to prep do, do not have an incentive to go shopping on Fifth Avenue and all that. But <laughs> for the most part, I agree with you. Uh, back to you, Gabriela. You were telling us before uh, about the investment world in general and, 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 and the NAFTA experience especially, and you were comparing the choices and, and, and saying, well, in, 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 essence, in essence, Mexico has not really hosted yet an after, an after case. Let, let's talk now about cities in particular. Uh, are there cases in which the dispute or the difference between the parties regarding the seat did not so much involve the, the country where the place would be, but rather the specific city, thank you, within the country where the dispute would be city? Yes, yes, and let me just give you some numbers which I always um, tell in. Uh, if you look at all the NAFTA cases, right, whether uh, there has been agreement of the parties about the city or uh, it has come to the tribunal to decide the question, uh, the winner <laughs> is uh, basically Washington DC with uh, 40, 4% of the cases. Then you have 31% uh, of the cases which go to Toronto. And then uh, you have uh, a much less percent that is divided between Vancouver, Montreal, Ottawa, Miami, and New York. Okay? These are NAFTA cases, just NAFTA cases, right? And then if you go to uh, agreement of the parties, it's very interesting because then it goes actually back uh, to Toronto as the place <coughs> of arbitration and uh, Washington in second place. 50% for Toronto, 36% for Washington. But then if it comes to the tribunal to decide, tribunals like Washington. And so they, in 60% of the, 67% the, uh, of the cases, they have decided in favor of Washington DC. And then it's really evenly, evenly um, uh, distributed between Vancouver, New York, Miami, and Ottawa. And then I, I looked at when it has been a competing uh, exercise between US cities, since we are debating about New York, right? And when is New York has played a role, and why, why uh, it has been, on which reasons a tribunal has linked to one or the other city. And give, let me give you two uh, examples. First, um, there is uh, the Detroit International Bridge case versus Canada, in which claimant proposed Washington DC or New York. The tribunal rejected a seat in Canada as proposed by respondent because Canada had adopted legislation that claimant alleged had discriminated against it. So Canada was out. Uh, and for neutrality reasons, the tribunal decided that DC was more neutral than New York in a very interesting way. It said, uh, Washington DC, though the seat of federal government of the US, has an established and generally recognized role as a host of international institutions, such as the World Bank, ICSID, and the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights, and consequently, particular neutrality in the context of legal disputes. So the tribunal finds no evidence of any difficulties for either respondent or claimant in having Washington DC as the seat of this arbitration, 
and it notes that Clayman's home state in the United States is Michi Michigan. I found it very interesting because the tribunal, after a long debate, is a pretty well-reasoned decision, um, decided on neutrality on the basis of this having international organizations in DC, like New York wasn't yeah, that one, right? Yeah, exactly. Or that, or that <laughs> the, there are international arbitration <laughs> institutions also here, right? Um, honestly, I think that uh, part of it is that uh, ca claimants, counsel for claimant, basically plead much more for DC. And no, no, why? Because I don't represent claimants. But, <laughs> um, but then a second case that I found very interesting, and I'm sure here my colleagues will say something about this, is the Mesa Power Group versus Canada. And this is a PCA case, and claimants submitted that the seat of arbitration should be in the United States, and it asked for Miami or New York. So it comes very well within the discussion. Uh, um, but it was not for the reasons you said, by the <laughs> way, that they chose Miami. It was very interesting. It said uh, that it was the tribunal decided that Miami was a better place because the tribunal, uh, the power of uh, tri arbitrary tribunal to compel evidence sitting in New York was more, more restricted under Section 7 of the Federal Arbitration Act. And I'm going to quote exactly what they say and why. It said, in light of the submissions of the parties, the tribunal finds it reasonable to discard a New York seat. Indeed, from the decision of the United States Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit, that we have mentioned, in Dinegy, it appears that the power of arbitral tribunals seated in New York to compel on evidence under Section 7 of the Federal Arbitration Act is subject to restrictions. And then apparently it's because the US Court of Appeals, but I'm sure you guys know better than I, for the Second Circuit reversed the decision issued by a district court concluding that the latter did not have personal jurisdiction over a Texas resident with no contacts in New York in a proceeding brought under Section 7 of the Federal Arbitration Act to compel evidence with a subpoena issued by an arbitral tribunal sitting in New York. In this case, uh, Clayman had said that there, were, there was a lot of evidence uh, that needed to be compelled from outside the seat of the, of the arbitration. And so the, uh, the NAFTA tribunal decided that since on the basis of the pleadings of the parties, there seemed to be more restrictions for an arbitral tribunal sitting in New York, they went to Miami. And, um, and I found that very interesting uh, because honestly, uh, Many of the much mm, the debate in NAFTA cases go more into where the evidence goes, the neutrality, which, in my view, is red herring because uh, New York is equally neutral, um, and uh, and New York can certainly be a place for arbitration in NAFTA cases. And lately, in the last three cases, uh, New York has play a role more by, more by agreement of the parties. And, um, and that is certainly a role that council needs to be playing, no? If, if I were representing one of the parties and I got the ruling from the tribunal saying we're not going to New York because the power from the tribunal to compel production of evidence is very limited, I'd, I'd start sweating before picking up the phone and telling my client what the tribunal's inclination is and, and the likely amount we're going to be spending in discovery fights <laughs> during, the, during the case. Um, Henry, as, as Gabriela was explaining, uh, sometimes one of the reasons you choose New York or some other seat as the place of your arbitration is that it's neutral. And that means occasionally you end up having in New York arbitration cases held that do not even have any connection, any relationship whatsoever with New York, or maybe a very vague relationship, if at all. Do you, do you see, when you go through the case law, when you appear in court, do you see any bias? Do you see any difficulties? Do you, do you see any lack of interest uh, in the judiciary towards those cases that have a more vague uh, nexus with New York? Do you see non-US parties 
more poorly treated by the courts here in arbitration cases? No, no I, again, back to my same point. Um, you know, all these cases in New York end up before this <laughs> small group, a relatively small group of judges. And um, <clears throat> I mean, in my career, I've never seen in that federal court any either pro-New York or anti-non-New York, whether rest of the country or rest of the world, bias. I mean, it's a very neutral group. Um, I have litigated in other states in, and have seen bias. Um, um, I have a horrible story about <laughs> Atlanta, Georgia, which I won't tell, <laughs> but. Um, um, they're not used to the snow days. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, they're not used to snow days or foreigners. Um, but um, um, no, I have, I've never seen anything other than neutrality. This case, I keep referring to this case, uh, this Abengoa case, it was, you know, it was a, it was a classic um, where a Spanish purchaser and a Brazilian seller um, chose New York law and New York situs. Obviously, they weren't going to choose Brazil or Spain. Uh, New York was the place. Actually, the underlying arbitration, I only handled the litigation, um, you know, the challenge. The underlying arbitration was handled by Brazilian lawyers on one side and Spanish lawyers on the other, um, you know, in a conference room, you know, on Park Avenue. Um, and then we got into court, no nexus with New York. Um, really, the only nexus with the, US was, with the U.S. was, other than the arbitration clause, was that you know, the, con the contract provided for the payment of dollars. Um, and, you know, we get treated extremely well. Um, so it's, bias is just not an issue. One thing to talk, to mention, maybe as reflecting not just the judiciary, but New York law, as many of you may know, um, New York by statute specifically provides that a New York choice of law and a New York choice of forum clause is enforceable notwithstanding and must be enforced by judges notwithstanding that the contract has nothing to do with New York. And that was, those were adopted I guess in the 70s because there had been some judges who were saying you know this contract has nothing to do with New York so we're not going to apply New York law or we're not you know, whatever and that was overruled legislatively 20 or 30 years ago to make it clear that the New York legislature requires that New York remain a commercially receptive center to transactions that don't really have much to do with New York so it's never been an issue in my practice and in fact if you, if you go look through some of the cases where there's been <coughs> litigation brought to enforce arbitral awards and you just look at the parties on the various sides so many of them you know neither party has any nexus to New York or even the United States and you'll see you know a Norwegian party here a Spanish party there a Brazilian party it's you know it really is seen as kind of the international place um, you know to to both arbitrate and you know the courts are obviously quite comfortable with that Thank you very much. B before we open it for the floor, Natalia, let's, let's finish with a very direct question. We've been talking about New York, how it compares to the cities in the U.S., the U.S., how it compares to the countries. Uh, we haven't really touched yet on the elephant in the room. Uh, quite at the beginning we were saying, if you look at some statistics, and of course it depends on where they come from, uh, but it looks like New York is up there with London as one of the world's uh, preferred seats to arbitrate. There's no doubt Paris is also a very popular seat of arbitration. So is uh, Geneva. There are four or five uh, places worldwide, uh, Singapore, that clearly enjoy the favor of uh, companies involved in commercial disputes. Uh, in your experience, how does New York compare to all these other uh, big league players, to Geneva, London, Paris, Singapore. Um, does it lag behind? D d d does, it, does it prevail over them? And if so, why? Well, uh, actually it's the elephant <coughs> in the room <laughs> because I would say that in my experience it, it's a little bit behind Paris and Geneva uh, because at least for Brazilian parties, Paris and Geneva have a more familiar uh, uh, law system. It's civil law, it's not common law, which is something different. So, uh, the, usually in-house counsel have this concern, oh, I, I wouldn't go to New York because I, 
I, I don't know the, the, I'm not that familiar with the system. Well, in Paris or Geneva, French, you can read a little bit, you can have a, a, a glimpse of what's being said in the decision, in the law. They are usually more comfortable with, with uh, civil law uh, countries. So it's actually the elephant in the room. But another issue that raises concern also con concerning New York is the manifest disregard. Unfortunately, uh, I've seen several US practitioners saying that manifest disregard is it, it's just a myth, which I believe due to all these researches, but uh, this has not uh, arrived in uh, the client's ears. So <laughs> it's, really, it's really tough to convince that uh, this shouldn't be an issue and you have, you're in, the, this, in one of the cities that has uh, a very good reputation in arbitration. And uh, another one uh, would be the gateway issue actually, comparing to Paris at least and to Geneva, you have a, a pretty straightforward uh, rule on competence, competence which is not see, perceived at least like this regarding the, the, how the, the courts enforce arbitration agreements. So uh, the gateway, gateway <coughs> issue uh, may, may be seen as an issue, at least for in-house counsel, which know a little bit of arbitration. They, oh, it's not that easy. It's not very clear for me. So uh, I, I'm not sure the, the arbitration agreement will be enforced or not. So it's, it, it may be an issue also to be considered. If I may just add a footnote to that by way of anecdote, I recently had this conversation with a client, a sophisticated client who uh, comes from Latin America and for years had been choosing Paris as the place of arbitration uh, based uh, on the same reasons that you were outlining, mostly the common law, uh, the civil law divide and the perception that in Paris, in a civil law uh, system, it feel, the client would feel a little bit more at home. And, and then suddenly, a few months ago, the client instructed us to strike Paris going forward from its uh, contracts and to choose New York. <coughs> and I remember asking the client, why? Where did the decision come from? And, and, and he said, and, and I found this a very sophisticated and well thought through argument. He said, we, we've detected that New York being the financial capital of the world, if we end up having to enforce, we always end up having to go to New York. That's where money goes through. And federal courts are very, very good at uh, freezing a money wire that just happens to go through the, through the banking system here, even if it's only for a few minutes or a, or a few seconds. And, and, and he was saying, listen, w we've arbitrated in Paris for ages, uh, but we always ended up enforcing in New York. So we thought we better go and arbitrate directly in New York and then <laughs> spare us the trouble of having to seek enforcement of a foreign award in, in, in New York. Well, and in fact, you know, there is law in the Second Circuit where um, you know, if you want to just purely enforce an award where it's non-New York parties, non-New York mm -hmm. CITES, uh, you know, where court you know, may be more <laughs> reluctant on the issue of form non-convenience you know, to, to enforce that there. So if you think that you know, this is where the other party is going to have their assets and we're going to want to enforce, the easiest path of enforcement, if you don't have any New York parties at all, is to have it cited here. And, and as Henry said, being cited here doesn't necessarily mean you have to actually physically do it here mm -hmm. if it's the seat of arbitration. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I, I don't practice uh, French law. I'm occasionally involved in Paris-related cases. And it always strikes me, especially when I talk to colleagues in Paris, that uh, despite the very solid arbitration tradition that you have in France, you still have these erratic rulings coming out every now and then whereby an award is, is an alt. And, and, and I have a colleague, I, I was sitting in an arbitral tribunal and, and uh, I remember sitting with a co-arbitrator who was from France and he was warning me about the dangers of annulment if we did this or that, if we didn't follow a specific format in the award that, that, that I found quite interesting coming from the other side of the Atlantic or practicing mostly on the other side of the, of the Atlantic because those were situations that typically wouldn't lead to an annulment in the, in the US. Well, you know, <coughs> on that note, you know, sw the Swiss lawyers bragged that you know, no award, award is ever annulled in Switzerland and then about <laughs> two months ago an award was annulled in Switzerland. So. <laughs>
<laughs> at this point, we've probably talked too much, and this is your event. <coughs> l l let us open the floor, because I'm sure there may be questions. I would be very interested in hearing your views on choice of arbitration when you have a sovereign government as the adverse party, and whether your choice of jurisdiction has any influence on that, and um, how your uh, how New York as a as a, uh, a jurisdiction or other jurisdictions may influence that view. I think Ariela has told us a little bit from the NAFTA standpoint, but if you want to answer that from a more broad uh, perspective, that'd be great. Well, yes, I think uh, when sovereigns are part in arbitration, there are other grounds besides the law, et cetera, that could be important. And it depends very much also whether uh, the dimension of the dispute. Uh, I, if there is a dispute in which you have a sovereign be and besides being, uh, I would say, um, uh, commercial or uh, uh, typical dispute, you have measures that could be politically uh, tainted. Then uh, sovereigns, uh, the, the state will have certain views depending who is the counterparty, what is the stake. And honestly, in my experience, sometimes the US is not the first choice. And, and, and I think uh, it's public <laughs> record that Bolivia and Venezuela don't like to agree to a US, yeah, to a US seat. Uh, yes, that's true. They, uh, you know, when I started working at Curtis, I thought I would, I would be very often, I come very often to the US, but <coughs> I, I thought that most of my hearings will be here and uh, the place of arbitration will play a lot of ro uh, big, big role, and no. M many is in Europe. And, and, and honestly, you know, it's, uh, there are, they can, the U.S. can be or the best friend or the worst friend. <laughs> For many reasons. You know, sometimes are political reasons, sometimes are even visa issues. Honestly, visa issues, as simple and practical as that. For certain people, coming to the U.S. is not that easy. And um, and even for you know under I, I I do most mostly exit cases and under exit you have very uh, specific rules for visa immunities etc. And the U.S. has been the one country that has not given visas, not even to parties to arbitrators that for some reason they don't like. So. That's that's the way it is. Yeah, I, I would, you know, I would confess, you know, I I have not been involved in any investment treaty arbitrations here in New York. I mean, I commonly have them in The Hague, in Stockholm, uh, in D.C. Uh, you know, the Supreme Court case now that that my firm's representing Argentina uh, came out of a, a D.C. Circuit uh, decision, uh, but I, I haven't really uh, seen much in New York. And, and I think the point that you raise, frankly, is a very good one. Um, you know, with regards to just making it convenient for parties to travel uh, there. You know, New York, it, it's so easy for, you know, we have, everybody has consulates here and with the UN here, and, and you think that it that can and should be easier, and we'd like to see it made easier. Uh, but the fact is, you know, the, the people in The Hague at the ICJ do wonders in terms of, you know, <laughs> visas issued instantly for people to travel and, and, and for officials and arbitrators to get to, get to hearings. Yeah. Um, that I think perhaps more can be done uh, if we do want to promote New York as a place for, for more sovereign arbitrations. I think in, in thinking about sovereigns, I mean, there are three, there, we tend to think of two categories. There are commercial cases, and you tend to think that's commercial parties on both sides, and then there are these treaty cases. There's actually a huge slice in the middle, which are commercial cases against state-owned companies. Yeah, I mean, that's a different. huge yeah. uh, body of cases. and. The problem is the state-owned companies, what you really, my, my punchline is, and this is really not so much a New York issue as a U.S. versus non-U.S. issue, mm -hmm. you really do have to look at the relevant, that the local law of sovereign immunity because those state-owned companies are treated very differently for sovereign immunity purposes under different countries' sovereign immunity rules. Yeah. And that has implications for, well, mainly for enforcement. 
um, and the extent to which you can enforce your award. And, the, and the, the thing that's very positive about the US, and this again is, assumes you've got the right stuff in your contract, the US is very good on waivers of sovereign immunity. And they recognize, they're well recognized, they're perhaps at least in countries that I've dealt with, they're more clearly those waivers are effective than in their full breadth in the US. But that's, to me, for that sort of middle category, that's what you really have to look at. But and I, I don't think that, and that's not particularly, that's maybe more, well, that's a choice of situs, as I said, at the national level rather than New York. But then it's that, that you know, if you're representing a claimant, then you will argue for that because that's you want, what you want. Correct. Right? Correct. But if you are representing a state entity, <laughs> then maybe I mean, yeah, you will have concerns, you're, right? You're, you're, but you're a nut. You're a nut <laughs> if you enter into a commercial contract with a state entity without a very broad waiver of sovereign immunity. Because uh, then you have you, then you have remedies with you know no enforcement or rights with no remedies. So some hands there, tentatively raising. Yes, hi. Uh, I'd be curious to get the panel's opinion uh, on the recent uh, enactment of the Clean Companies Act in Brazil. I know it's all of eight days old, but would that, will, that, will that have uh, any impact on the choice of arbitration location, uh, you know, given that, that strengthening, certainly, of the Brazilian uh, corruption law? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I, I'm, I'm not aware of any, uh, it's, it's funny because it's been really noticed in the newspapers and everybody's talking about that, but I haven't felt any consequence of that yet, you know, so uh, I, I, I haven't felt any consequence yet. I, let's hope for something to change. It's maybe the politicians banging the drum yeah. that they got something done. <laughs> I think we have another question over there. Um, I'm just curious if you think there will be um, any effect from Canada's recent ratification of the ICSID convention at the end of last year. That will affect the calculus at all? Well, uh, I think what they did is well, the process is uh, still not, has not ended for Canada, I think. Uh, but. Not it's, yet, right? it's not exactly. It's not right. enforced yet. Yeah. So uh, I think yeah. they. You know, the, I'm not a Canadian lawyer, so I'm <laughs> saying that my understanding is that internally yeah. it has not ended. So the exit convention is not really enforced for them yet. And uh, of course, if that the t when that the time comes uh, and um, exit uh, becomes available. And I think it would have an effect. Um, and I, in my experience, Canada has actually, most of the cases against Canada had been UNCITRAD cases. And their experience um, from a cost perspective uh, was very bad. And as a result, they actually put in uh, recent and more recent treaties, like all the UNCITRAD cases would actually go through the fees of exit, and maybe from, from a practical perspective, also push the government to try to go further in exit. And um, but so far, I don't think it's a, it's yet, but it's yet in force. Excellent. I think we may have time for one or more questions yet. Is there any? If the reception and the cocktails are too attractive, we can just <laughs> call it quits here. Diogo, are you? Shall we yarn? Yeah. All right, well, thank you very much, everyone, and join me in thanking this wonderful panelist. Thank you. Thank you.